Welcome everyone to the 2023 Global Animal Disaster Management Conference, brought to you in partnership with Animal Evac New Zealand and our platinum sponsor, Four Paws International. Before we begin, a few basic housekeeping items. The Zoom chat feature has been disabled, so if you have any questions, we encourage you to use the Q&A box. This year, we have enabled multilingual closed captioning. If you would like to hear the presentation in another language, please click the closed caption icon at the bottom of your screen. We encourage you to use the hashtag GADMCONF in all your social media posts about the conference to help spread the word. A short evaluation will be made available as you exit the presentation. Your feedback is valuable to us and will help to shape the next GADMAC conference. Finally, the video recording of this presentation and the other presentations will be available later this year once they have been properly edited. We are privileged to have our two speakers with us today. Mr. Gerardo Huertas is an animal disaster risk reduction consultant based in Costa Rica, focusing on developing capacity for preparedness and resilience. Dr. Diego Hernandez is a veterinary doctor and research professor at Unig Agaria, Colombia, and a volunteer specialist in search and rescue. Together, they are discussing search and rescue dogs, heroes or martyrs. Gerardo, Diego, welcome. Thank you, Jean. What if I told you there is a planet where dogs have superpowers and some of them have dedicated their lives to save humans in deep trouble? A British dog was injured while helping the recovery efforts after Turkey's deadly earthquake but he needed to be back at work soon. These dogs are highly trained to sniff out the scent of a human trapped deep under the rubble, stop and bark loudly to alert their handlers to the spot where they have found it. A second dog is then released to confirm the finding. Rescue dogs of all races traveled to Turkey and from as far as Mexico, Germany, Croatia, El Salvador, Libya, Northern Ireland, Poland, the US, and even Ukraine. These rescue dogs are thought to be VIP team members, but that's not always the case. The pure, joyous, selfless behavior of these animals in the face of grave hazards and dangers, the lack of safeguards and transparency for their welfare prompted us to write about this. Chosen and trained from puppyhood by their handlers, they should be treated as four-legged colleagues and experts in the dangerous searching of survivors trapped in confined spaces deep under the debris of fallen buildings, which often are very unstable structures waiting for to further collapse. These animals carry this dangerous work gladly in exchange for a good word from their handlers, some playtime or a favorite toy. Okay, these dogs are uniquely equipped to find a needle in a haystack, namely humans barely alive, buried deep, no matter how faint their scent may be, and for human rescue teams to start working on the shoring of access routes and makeshift tunnels, an incredible dangerous job to reach move boulders and extricate survivors. No piece of technology can even match the capacity dogs have to sniff survivors through tons and tons of rubble. But then again, no piece of technology may experience pain and bleed to death at work. Working conditions for these brave animals are nightmarish as they walk and crawl barefooted on top of broken concrete, steel, glass, pipes, and toxic leaks of all kinds, sniffing through dangerous fumes and endless dust into impossible narrow spaces, looking for the fading traces of life only they can sense. As any dog does, they live to please their handlers and would work themselves to death if not kept in check. 
a few, a few um, case studies. During the Ecuador earthquake five years ago, rescue dogs bled to death as, as the teams did not have a dedicated veterinarian with them to tend to life-threatening wounds. To add insult to injury, the animal rescue team working in the city, coming from the capital, reported having spent their annual budget on this operation alone, and it was only February. The knee-jerk reaction of the public in Ecuador was to donate booties uh, lo locally made for the animals to work with less risk of getting deep cuts in their paws. But that significantly increases the chances of those animals getting caught in the twisted steel rods, broken pipes, and loose cables jamming the access inside the rubble. Dogs need months to get used to these booties, and the, the booties themselves have to be pretty specialized, so they did not uh, end up uh, wearing them. After Turkey, the IFRC, International Federation of the Red Cross, red flagged the presence of poisonous asbestos in many buildings, even though its use had been banned since 2010 in that country. And I quote, with, with over 210 million tons of rubble, relief teams and victims were exposed to elevated health risks from asbestos. During the Turkish earthquake rescue operations, Mexican rescue dog died reportedly hit by fallen debris, although later reports um, circulated, uh, explained that the animal just died from exhaustion and from age, which makes it uh, very difficult to believe um, on the lack of transparency. Another case was uh, the Haiti earthquake in Port-au-Prince, Patrick Slater, a handler, and his dog were entertained by men with machetes inside a falling building, demanding that a mortal victim be extricated, whole or piece by piece, from under heavy, unstable debris, or else. Luckily, both men and the dog were able to escape the scenario, but the tense episode traumatized the dog so badly it refused to work anymore and had to be sent back home to undergo reinforcement training. Sadly, we often witness canine teams begin for free veterinary care from charities and well-meaning private veterinary clinics as their own animals programs are poorly funded. Those animals hardly stand a change to come back alive from the field. While that is inevitable for all, for all of us, during disaster, this situation with canines may be preventable. No dog should die during a rescue operation. So whose fault is it then? This particular rescue canine alone died one and a half months after returning from Turkey. And the final report of autopsy is still pending. This is one of the few research papers on the subject of search and rescue dogs and the impact of um, rescue operations on their health. This paper was 100% based on bibliography research. And as one of the main challenges, it cites the fact that it was the dog handlers who conducted the assessment of the animal's health, making findings such as veterinary diagnosis and behavioral assessments significantly subjective, especially in the case of post-traumatic stress syndromes. Having said that, the external injuries, internal problems, and as I said, the PTSD speak for themselves as important red flags. The 2020 INSARAC guidelines on preparedness and response. INSARAC stands for International Search and Rescue Advisory Group of the UN, state that the rescue dog component must meet, must meet certain requirements within national and international user groups. Beyond INSARAC, the ILO, or International Rescue Organization, also focuses on rescue dogs, and although this organization were directly approached 
none have an answer yet. These are like focal points in several countries, on the other hand, were also approached to validate these findings. Golden standards. Given that these dogs may be the victims only hope to be found, they need to be in top shape, better than regular pet dogs. That means all of the above conditions, top immunization protocols, plus clear decontamination protocols during field operations. They should sleep and eat with their handlers, work for short periods of time, and rest plenty, given that they work barefooted without goggles and dust masks. Dust masks. Their handlers need to keep the integrity of their paws, eyes, and body in constant check. And they should travel by air in the main cabin and travel by land in secure transport cages. These are the dogs from the Mexican Red Cross um, traveling to uh, Turkey. Although these standards should apply to all K-19 members, globally that doesn't happen yet. And sadly, not all teams in developing countries are well equipped, staffed or resourced, let alone certified internationally, as tight budgets and local logistical blues are always an issue. Ideally, local domestic canine and search and rescue capacity, as opposed to foreign teams traveling abroad, is far more effective if physically available immediately or within the first crucial hours to reach and save more human survivors. Finally, transparency in the case of accidents and casualties of these highly trained and valuable dogs is then a red, another red flag for international accreditation. Top-notch welfare, nutrition, veterinary and health care, plus the vital veterinary trauma capacity in the field could become a reality in every country with the help and generosity of a few good, good willing local enterprises, insurance companies, banks, or just good hearted folks sponsoring these heroes. May this be an invitation to INSARAC, IRO, veterinary boards, civil defense department, and the private sector to ensure that these life saving heroes are treated according to the best animal welfare standards and transparency is enforced everywhere to account for them after every operation, before the next event requires them to save more human victims and perhaps sacrifice their own lives in the process. The noble gesture, Turkish Airlines had to fly a few Thai but happy dogs on the business cabin and for the long journey back, should be the norm and not the exception. So to recap, uh, dog guides need to be trained in veterinary aid, trained and equipped. Field trauma veterinarians should travel with their teams as one more uh, team member and health, welfare and transport are paramount for the welfare of these animals. So when guide dogs for the blind and judge, a common may be unsafe, they can refuse it. This is called intelligent disobedience. If dogs could only teach us this skill. And here is Wilson, the army canine that died in the Colombian jungle during the operation to find the lost children. He was not trained to search and rescue or even to survive in the jungle. May this be a warning not to send unfit or untrained animals into harm's way just because they trust their human handlers blindly. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you both very oh. much for a hey. very thought provoking presentation. What is the minimum rest time between incidents not between working periods but when they're done with one incident go home and then deploy to the next one what is the minimum recommended time for that i think um before i let my 
my uh, veterinary colleague answer, I think that is up to veterinarians and the, the, uh, the troubling signs we're finding is that veterinarians are seldom around these dogs. Diego. Yes, uh, well, basically, well, there are many kind of protocols that our own uh, five responder organization works. So the recommendation is that the dog must work at least 20, 25 minutes and rest one and two hours uh, before the work. This kind of time maybe can change. Uh, according to the weather, according to the extension of the city. And there are many things we, that, that we made to, to discuss here. And, but uh, Jean, if you, um, if you ask uh, in between operations, I think veterinarians should assess the, uh, the, uh, the health of the animals coming back from an operation. In the case of Turkey, for example, having, having expose those animals to so much asbestos. Imagine the, uh, we don't know what happened, but imagine the Colombian example that Diego presented, an, an animal that died a month and a half afterwards, and we still don't know the, the cause. Uh, they need to be treated better. That's, that's just not fair. Not for everything we ask of them, absolutely not. We do have another question. Has any consideration also been given to muscle manipulation techniques to help the dogs perform? Also, is there a possibility of a compression suit to help with hazmat or protection from environmental conditions? Well, uh, that is a good question because uh, we have seen uh, many ways to protect their dogs. Uh, the, the, the international methods to training dogs, uh, some of them, uh, trying to explain that the dogs need to uh, inside to the instructor of the uh, scenario uh, without uh, any kind of uh, dress or some kind of uh, things that maybe can um, produce some injuries in your hands, in your face. However, that, that, that's, uh, that is uh, something uh, that we need to discuss because every scenario is different. Uh, every country has the different um, situation uh, and the resources uh, are different. So, I think it's a good question, but we need to discuss uh, in every situation. I guess I guess the, uh, the secretive nature of the uh, welfare uh, of the dogs and the, and the search and rescue teams is what needs to end quickly. Otherwise, uh, there will be no going forward uh, and. Um, and a be better better odds for these animals during during earthquakes. That would be the end result of this conversation. I've heard of air filter masks for the dogs. Has any research been done if that ruins their ability to smell and therefore would render them ineffective in search and rescue? Gerardo shared that masks are difficult for the dog especially when going into rubble, they may only be sent in, if that's the correct term, on just a few molecules to locate someone. Is that correct, Diego? Uh, yes, yeah, definitely. Um, well, I, I just want to, to summarize something. Um, it's not uh, easy for uh, the different uh, teams. Uh, for example, here in Colombia, uh, we have a little problem because uh, every um, local authority, I mean, for, it, uh, for instance, for instance, uh, civil defense, uh, Red Cross, uh, they have their own uh, protocols to uh, management of dogs. Uh, they have their own uh, sanitary protocols. Uh, 
health activities for uh, every dogs. So we need to engage all this kind of method and try to get just one to, uh, to get uh, animal welfare standards uh, in every case on in, in every uh, rescue operation. Thank you gentlemen so much for being with us and presenting with us this year.